Hello, and welcome to AIM International's preparatory tutorials for the Information Certification Exam. I'm Steve Weissman, Principal Consultant at Holly Group and a certified AIM training instructor in the realm of content, process, and information management. I'll be your guide as we review the exam's major domains of expertise, and I'll tell you all you need to know to earn that passing grade. Today's subject is eDiscovery, a key part of this special certification which AIM created to support you as you solve your organization's existing information-related problems and plan for its future. For 60 years, AIM has been the leading nonprofit association helping users understand how to best manage documents, content, records, and business processes. This module will define eDiscovery and outline its core practices and processes. Part of the Secure and Preserve Knowledge Domain, one of six within the certification program, it will include coverage of eDiscovery itself, the eDiscovery legal process, the eDiscovery IT reference model, and the eDiscovery maturity model. eDiscovery is short for electronic discovery, which is defined as the process of discovery in civil litigation that's carried out in electronic formats. It encompasses what's most often referred to as electronically stored information, or ESI. Examples of the types of ESI included are emails, instant messaging chats, documents, accounting databases, CAD CAM files, websites, and any other electronic information that could be relevant evidence in a lawsuit. Also included in eDiscovery are raw data and metadata, which forensic investigators can review for hidden evidence. As a practice, eDiscovery runs from the time a lawsuit is foreseeable to the time the digital evidence is presented in court. At a high level, the process is as follows. Data is identified as relevant by attorneys and placed on legal hold. That's illustrated in steps 1 and 2 of this diagram. Attorneys from both sides determine the scope of discovery, identify the relevant DSI, and make eDiscovery requests and challenges. Those are depicted in steps 3 and 4. Search parameters can be negotiated with an opposing counsel or auditor to identify what's being searched and to ensure needed evidence is identified and non-evidence is screened out, thereby reducing the overall effort required to search, review, and produce it. Evidence is then extracted and analyzed using digital forensic procedures and is usually converted into PDF or TIFF form for use in court, illustrated here in steps 5 through 8. It often can be advantageous to use pattern and trend identification and other analytical search techniques so that these tasks can be performed more efficiently and make less use of expensive human resources. Here's another take on the same subject, this time from the IT perspective. It's the Electronic Discovery Reference Model, and it's the industry standard for such things, and it consists of nine steps that we'll walk through quickly here. The first two stages are information management and identification. These involve getting your electronic house in order so you can mitigate risk and expenses should e-discovery become an issue anywhere from the initial creation of electronically stored information through its final disposition. For example, accurate, well-managed metadata means faster searching, as well as defensible audit trails and improved security and access controls. The better the information management practices, the less data there will be to sift through, including records past the retention date, untracked copies of documents, and misclassified documents. Next come preservation and collection to ensure that ESI is protected against inappropriate alteration or destruction and can be gathered for further use in the e-discovery process. The fourth segment involves processing, review, and analysis. These steps are aimed at reducing the volume of ESI and converting it, if necessary, to forms more suitable for review and analysis evaluating it for relevance and privilege, and evaluating it for content and context, including key patterns, topics, people, and discussions. Last, but by no means least, come production and presentation. These are engaged in delivering ESI to others in appropriate forms and using appropriate delivery mechanisms, as well as displaying ESI before audiences at depositions, hearings, trials, and so forth, especially in native and near-native forms to elicit further information, validate existing facts or positions, or persuade an audience. Rounding out the picture, 
Here is an e-discovery maturity model, which documents the evolution of organizational e-discovery strategy used to respond to litigation or regulatory demands. It has the standard five levels that range from ad hoc and chaotic at the early stages to degrees of optimizing at the more mature stages. Besides gauging the different levels of process maturity, movement through the levels also represents the acceptance and incorporation of e-discovery as a necessary business process. This module has taken us on a tour of electronic discovery, which includes eDiscovery's definition, the eDiscovery legal process, the eDiscovery IT reference model, and the eDiscovery maturity model. With this information now locked into your memory banks, you may next wish to review the module on eDiscovery web capture, authentication, and costs. The material you have just reviewed is part of a broader program of study that prepares you to take the information certification exam. This proctor test consists of 100 multiple choice questions and is delivered electronically by Prometric. You'll have two hours to complete it, and upon passing, you'll earn a professional certification that's valid for three years. For more information, please visit www.aim.org slash certification. Thank you.